driving me. Hello? I can just drive for a little bit. I can just drive for a little bit. Check once. Ah. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to your live stream panel. Uh, do you think I've got enough computers here? Uh, we're actually live streaming on YouTube, so please do not swear. Or if you swear, just be really, really quiet. Uh, and uh, so welcome again. First of all, I want to say a massive thanks to the ADE team to make this panel happen. And generally, ADE, I think pretty much all of you agree this is one of the best and the biggest ADE. So well done, ADE team. Uh, the panel is about live streaming. It's obviously still relatively new genre. So uh, many record labels, many artist management companies, and mainly brands are picking up on live streaming. So we thought it's, it's a good idea to have a discussion panel. Uh, and uh, first and for foremost, uh, I, uh, I want to talk to you about a little bit of my background and how the, the whole concept came about. I, uh, first of all, my name is Bela Molnar. I'm coming from 24-7 uh, Films, which is a London-based uh, content production house. And I, I like to think that we are quite unique uh, for many, many reasons, but I'm not going to get into details about that. Uh, I kind of fell in love with live streaming about six, seven years ago when I produced and directed one of the biggest uh, live stream shows, what certainly at the time, uh, Diesel, Diesel, as in the fashion brand, was 30 years old, and they, cr they decided that the way they should celebrate is that they're going to live stream from 19 major cities from around the world or around the clock for 24 hours. So it was, imagine like a Eurovision uh, contest, but basically time shifted. So the, the, the event started up in Tokyo and finished in uh, uh, Los Angeles. And I was on the middle of it with London and partially looking after Amsterdam as well. And it was all live streamed. And uh, obviously it was a love at first sight kind of thing. It, it, was, uh, it, it brought back the exci excitement of live broadcast television uh, into my life. And as a multi-camera director, you can ask for more. So live stream has been still the most exciting part of uh, my life, certainly. And I think many video engineers and many of the guys who are representing here, the world's biggest platforms, they will uh, underpin my opinion. That it, it is nerve-wracking, but an incredibly exciting uh, genre. I keep calling it a genre because I think uh, live stream is a completely separate, separate ball of game when it comes to content. Despite the fact that you can live stream any type of content, I think uh, there are certain rules and regulations what you always have to follow. So I came about live streaming events about six years ago, and, and, uh, and television was obviously losing their commissioning funds. Uh, less and less money for, uh, for music uh, mainly came from the fact that Record, label were, record labels were desperate to throw music programs at television channels because they were struggling to understand the digital revolution, MP3 generation. They weren't sure, they, they were over-promoting uh, the artist. And uh, in, in the height of their panic, they just started throwing fully-fledged 60-minute live gigs at channels for free. So that pretty much killed you know, half of the, the incredible production companies who were basically making their money from producing credible music events. And uh, so man, many of the companies are downscaled, merged, uh, and, and lots of companies disappeared. And, and it, it took a while before everyone sort of got their head around advertiser-funded programming, which was a, the new buzzword, AFP. Uh, and all it meant that people like myself, who comes from a creative background, coming from film school, we were forced to learn about uh, the business side of our business, should I say. It wasn't enough just to be the creative type turning up behind a vision mixer and mix cameras and, and create amazing content. You, you needed to know what to do with that content. And live streaming obviously became a massive part of the for me and many of the production companies, a, a new stream of revenue and, and, and a new sort of way of getting to platforms. The only problem was that uh, there, there wasn't that many platforms where you can live stream to yet. Uh, but that obviously changed over the past uh, few years. So luckily we are, uh, you know, apart from obviously the two gentlemen who will talk about their little known platforms called Spotify and YouTube, uh, there are loads of other uh, websites and platforms you can use for live streaming of, you know, Ustream and live stream themselves. And, 
and, and many other sort of uh, uh, stream content uh, platforms. So at the moment, still music is very much funded by brands. Uh, we, we, we still couldn't get rid of them, but I'm not sure if we have to. Uh, and live streaming, obviously, for brands to locking down those incredibly young audiences to that you know, elusive 14 to 25 is still music content and live music content what, what locks them down the most. So I guess uh, my experts on the panel will once again underpin that it is a, a, a very important asset already in their strategies. And, uh, and we thought that it's, uh, you know, as much as it's a very vigorous process to get a live stream together for many, many reasons, uh, it's still a, a, a very interesting, very excited project. Uh, so that's pretty much about myself. Uh, we're live streaming this event as well as always, and uh, I'm, I'm going to introduce you to, uh, to my uh, panel guests from far left, or for you, sorry, far right, uh, Klaus Pfeiffer from Sony. He's looking after uh, the broadcast arm of Sony uh, to be exactly truthful to the title, Strategic Marketing Manager of Live Production, AV and Media Business Group Professional Solutions. Whew, sorry, I had to read that off. <laughs> every, everything was broadcast, every camera, every vision mixer, ev everything what broadcast related audiovisual material is, is pretty much your department. If I'm, I, I wanted to speak to you, Matthias, about YouTube. Uh, I know everybody knows the word YouTube, uh, but we, we just talked about this earlier. I still come across with people who don't even know that YouTube is actually owned by Google. And uh, so I think as much as people understand that, oh yeah, YouTube is that big video platform, there's so much more and, and so much in depth what you guys do at, at, at YouTube and Google. If you could give us a bit of just a top line sort of introductory of, of what YouTube is currently really in our life. Okay, so yes, exactly. YouTube is an ad-funded video platform. It was acquired by Google eight years ago. And it's true that at the beginning, it was a very basic uh, platform that allowed people to share video online. But it has become a massive uh, video platform for all creators around the world to share, engage, and create communities on their YouTube channels. Uh, I think a few years ago, it was very basic the way we, we engage with content by watching videos and then we left or we share the links. But now there's a true community around all the content. You can subscribe to the channel. You can like comment on it. And it's very important that, that some of the points that I want to, to share with you guys is that we're very different from television. On television, there's a, a one-way communication. While on YouTube, we really want to engage and we really want to focus on a two-way communication. There's a community that interacts with the creator. And you can watch it on the comments. You can watch it on the content. You can watch it on the people coming back and forth. And that's kind of the nature. Of course, the stats, as you can, I don't know if you know some of the stats, but we have a 1 billion unique audience per month on YouTube. And every minute, over 100 hours of content is being uploaded to the platform. So you can imagine the amount of you know, the, the, the service that we provide, the amount of bandwidth uh, hosting and services that needs to be provided for content owners. And also, we have a very strong and robust technology called Content ID that protects copyright holders. So if you have any rights, then we, we embrace you on a very legitimate platform. Thanks for the quick intro. I just want to apologize also. I'm not mucking around with the computers here, checking my emails. I'm actually live cutting the two cameras for the live stream. So uh, this, this, this is what a true multitasking, multi-camera director do, interviewing and cutting cameras. So we're going to go to camera three now. Oh, that's me. Maybe not. Uh, you just mentioned a couple of um, uh, uh, horrendously big numbers. Uh, can you mention a, f a few more big achievements, big events from 2013 or, or from the near past? Because I know that you guys have some incredible, incredible events under your belt. Yes, exactly. So specifically on live events, uh, we started with a live stream strategy two years ago. Actually, YouTube was the first ban. We used uh, YouTube as a live stream platform. And since then, we have seen all kind of other vertical streams from the Royal Wedding, uh, Tomorrowland, which is an amazing Belgian festival. And, and of course, the biggest to date has been the Red Bull Stratus that was watched by 8 million concurrent people. That means 8 million people at one particular time watching the event, whether it's from their laptops, uh, 
mobile devices, smartphones, smart TVs, anywhere. But it's, it's massive that we, we achieved to have similar numbers of what it could be considered the broadcaster's prime time on television. Uh, if uh, the skeptics would ask you that how does YouTube video streaming differs to any of the other platforms, because we know that there, that there are at least four or five quite major platforms behind YouTube in terms of uh, live streaming and content. How, what, what would be your USP in terms of uh, we are different because of this, that? Well, I think the, the, we're a very competitive platform from a technical side. Uh, in the last two years, the product has evolved a lot. Uh, and also this has allowed a lot of content owners, and especially in the music business, to reduce the amount of, of financial support, of financial muscle that you needed in order to live stream any event. Secondly, I think the, the platform is not a one-off platform that you choose to live stream. It's a true community that engage with your audience. Uh, we've seen from festivals, awards, artists, labels, everybody has their own unique channels, it's their own proposition to engage with live and video on demand. So I think it's just different than just using a player to satisfy the live event itself. And of course the data, I think something that YouTube does really well is capture the data where the people come from, the demographic, uh, you know, all that data, that back end, is really useful for everybody who works in the music landscape or any other vertical, because it will make you identify where your audience is and also what they're looking for on the platform. I think that will be the three, you know, kind of differentiators yeah. that we can share. Uh, and then I know whenever I'm having a meeting with you or anybody else at your team and, and we're talking about potential uh, new content uh, formats like the, the, the newly opened uh, uh, creative space in, in London and kind of the sentence what I keep hearing from uh, YouTube people is that, you know, as long as you come up with a format, what, what's not like television? You know, you guys are always looking for something what's not like television or, 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 or something different from television. Uh, what, 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 are the what, what are the things what makes YouTube kind of different from uh, television? What, what more, like, you know, you, you briefly mentioned monetization, but uh, uh, what other elements we can mention what uh, YouTube is, is different from television in general? Well, it's, it's really tough to say. We, we actually have a playbook for everybody. That's, that's one of our support assets that you can take a look to, to identify how you engage with your audience on, on YouTube. I think the key is, is to understand that people are going to watch it whenever they want, for any device they want, at any time they want. So it's, it's different as television. The proposition is totally different. And of course, you know, the length, the, the whole experience on YouTube is different. Uh, television was a very lean back position, lean back experience. While on YouTube is very proactive, you can share, you can interact. As I was saying at the beginning, you can comment. So that has to be reflected on your content strategy, whether it's on VOD or on live. And we've seen, especially on live streams, yeah, just raise your hand if you have seen one event on YouTube, any event. Partly. Partly. Okay. And have you seen, for example, Tomorrowland, Tomorrowland TV, the live stream? So the main difference is that it was curated. They came out with the creative concept that it was to have somebody who walked through the festival with the audience. And the numbers were a few times bigger. The other festivals, they were absolutely fantastic. The lineups were top of its kind. But of course, there was nobody telling you what was coming up, what was happening, you know. And, and that different touch made the whole experience totally different. Mm, yes and no, because that person was also giving you more information on the ground, going to the backstage, doing interviews, and also interacting with the audience, you know. That's my job, I educate people that I'm not this yet. <laughs> so, that's television. Like, I'm, 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 sorry, I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm saying that someone, it's a, it was a presenter actually, that was doing it. It was curated, you know, in that way. Well, having a, just connecting the cameras to one event, you know, and, and not even giving the audience some information about what is going to happen. Exactly. That's the key. And of course, you can do a one hour show, six hours, multiple days. It's really up to you. Red Bull Stratus, it was, was just one guy getting lifted on a balloon. But everybody was so excited because it could, anything could happen. You know, that, that excitement was reflected on the, on the engagement with the audience. I, th I think generally, when you're looking at live events on any of the platforms, uh, you feel a lot more connected to that content as opposed to television. I think we all grew up kind of sitting in front of the television and, 
and because we didn't understand much about content production and production companies and cameras. Now, an average person knows so much more about how to make a video. You know, 20 years ago, no, you know, very few <coughs> fortunate people knew how to make videos. So you, you always felt that you so disconnected and that television program, God knows where it's coming from, as opposed to now you're sitting, you know, just looking at your mobile phone or you're looking at your computer screen and, and it's live content there. And, and, and it's a it kind of, for me, it still has an element of rawness and spontaneity to, 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 to all of the live stream projects, whether it's because of the technical challenges, but somehow you can feel the energy coming through uh, so the, the, the live stream events, whether it's on you know, YouTube or any, any other platform. So I, I agree with you, it's, it is quite hard to come up with the content, especially, like I said, we all grew up on television. So in our head, that's, that's a format. We, we, we have that format embedded in our head and then when a client comes that look, we don't want to look like television. You know, like I always get from record labels and, uh, and, and band managers to say, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, we have a, a high-end, amazing, fantastic television show, music show, it's, it's ju ju uh, created by, hosted by Jules Holland. It's a late night program and he's got four or five bands on almost like an evolved st stage. They all set up in, in separate corners and he's just sort of hosting the program and the band plays a song and then have a chit chat. There's creators who came up with amazing concepts. Uh, you have platforms, you have us ready, the technology is there. I think the challenge now relies on you guys. It relies on coming up with the right concept and engaging with that audience that access our platforms on any device at any time of the day. So I think just keep working very close, platforms, uh, producers, creators, and of course you, everybody together to, to keep driving. You know, I think everything is in place now. Uh, and so let's see. And also that hate, hated subject, and I'm gonna bring it up, I don't care. Uh, the le legal aspects where we, you know, m many of us done fall. I, uh, I, six, seven years ago, I, I produced uh, a documentary for uh, Paul O'Kenford's life. It was called Paul O'Kenford 24-7. And uh, I thought that, you know, it's a very interesting concept. I didn't want to film him as a DJ, so there was not one piece of uh, frame in the whole uh, 78 minutes documentary where he's actually DJing. I, I wanted to show him as a person, uh, just like, you know, any of us, and, and meet mom and family, and uh, it went incredibly well up until the point when his management said, don't worry, we're gonna give you all the music because he's just coming up with a new album. This is uh, six years ago, I think he, his album was called A Lively Mind. And uh, you know, we just could give you all the tracks and you can use that for the documentary. So I was quite unexperienced as I learned later on uh, when my solicitors wanted to kill me because uh, as much as Paul waived all the rights for the and the record labels, the various labels waived the rights to, to, to the master sort of license. The publishing, oh my God. You know, we had Pharrell, we had Madonna, we had, we had artists who represented by average four or five publishing houses across the world. And, oh God, so I did a follow up to this gi uh, gig uh, just, just so I can prove the point. So two years later, I did uh, Carcox 24-7. And uh, what we did, we, went, we did a massive worldwide competition for music producers and music makers to send your track. Cars gonna listen, say, select tracks, and we're gonna buy the tracks in from you. Make sure you're not registered with any collecting societies. And that, that's how we managed to release it, because otherwise it would have been impossible. And kind of reflecting on that, live streams, unfortunately, has a legal end while using music uh, in general, using artwork, copyrights, and all that. He has a massive legal back, back end, and I, I, I can safely say working for both of you guys, or both of the platforms, is uh, unless you, you have it absolutely airtight, locked on, legally clean, neither one of you speaking to anybody, that's for sure. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's worth mentioning, because uh, you guys just opened up live streaming, obviously, for, for the masses. What's, what's the actual criteria now for uh, live streaming? You just need a channel, and you only need to have over 100 subscribers, which it might take you a few weeks to, or even days. 
to reach. And a bloody good solicitor, preferably someone who's in licensing. Uh, because obviously everybody who comes to you guys, uh, it, it, it has to have, they have to take care of their own. Absolutely. Uh, for live streaming, uh, as you know, we are a very legitimate platform. Uh, we have great deals with collective societies all around the world with publishers, labels, copyright holders, and we always feel that they need to get what they deserve for the copyrights, for the, uh, for the music or publisher or whatever rights they represent. Uh, but in this case, yes, uh, the partners need to come with all clearances. Uh, and then, of course, we, we are a platform. At the end of the day, we provide technology. We provide tools for you guys to reach out. And, of course, the audience. The audience, this is engaged um, by our different services, whether it's the app, whether it's the browser service, or any other way to access YouTube. Uh, so, yeah, uh, as a content producer myself, the, my, my recommendation is before you do any sort of uh, project, mm -hmm. always start with the music. Even here at ADE, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to you know, give any secrets away. When we said we're going to stream this panel live on, uh, on the channel, the first email was, Bela, there is no music. Is that correct? And I was like, no, there'll be no music. Because <laughs> everyone knows that the minute you have a piece of music, you're kind of asking for trouble. I'm not trying to turn all of your, you know, and, and it's, it's a good thing because obviously the, the producer, producers and the artists and, and the music makers are protected. But just be aware of it. Uh, it, it takes a while to, 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 to clear music for, for live streams. And one track can defeat a whole gig, basically. Sorry, you were raising your hand. Is it? Yeah, yeah, I wonder how you... Oh, sorry, there's a microphone there you brought. Yeah, uh, uh, I wonder how you treat uh, DJ sets. Uh, I, I do a festival. <laughs> I, I do a festival as well. And uh, do you only need a signed agreement from the artist, from the DJ and his management, or do you want a track list before he plays? No, no. I think we all share the same feeling with DJ sets. Uh, <laughs> no, no DJ sets, please. <laughs> no, no, no. We welcome them. And actually, you know, Tomorrowland is a great example. You know, you were able to see six hours or eight hours of live music from different DJs every day. So the solicitors, the legal team, did a great job uh, making sure that all the rights were, were clear in advance. Uh, you didn't answer my question. What kind of agreements did, they, did you see <laughs> that they show you? We don't, like, like, keep in mind that we have a system called Content ID. Uh, if the content owner doesn't whitelist that channel from those rights to be uh, live stream, then it will stop the live stream. So there's always a risk, of course. Uh, and in order to mitigate that risk, you need to have a professional legal team to look after your rights, advise the content owners, and get all the, the different rights cleared in advance. If you do the, the job, everything, all that, that work in advance, I guess, you know, I, I cannot speak for Spotify, but it will work on YouTube. Maybe you can share. Uh, yeah, we, we, we haven't done as many DJ set live streams. It's, it's been more with specific artists so to clear the rights for their songs is quite, is quite straight, say straightforward. It's much more straightforward because you know the songs in advance. Usually it's sort of two to three different people that you have to speak to. Um, so we, we haven't really gone into it as much as we'd like to, but um, I think that that's a, an area of focus for the company is to really find out how we can get... Obviously blanket agreements aren't, you know, ever people say they have, but often they don't. But it's about the process, just making the process easier to be able to get rights cleared of a pre-approved DJ set because at the moment there isn't any really, really clear process in place. It's not like something you can kind of like do quite easily. So on the band side, it's a bit easier. So that's kind of where we've been focused at, um, to date. While you've got the microphone on, uh, can we just carry on with, the, with, with the, your small company called Spotify? Yeah. Uh, what's, uh, what can you tell about Spotify? I know you guys are the, the fastest evolving, moving sort of platform. In the recent years, what Spotify achieved is it's quite remarkable. And I, I, I definitely know for a fact that most people are not aware of it. Can you sort of a little bit just top line explain what your department does and how live streaming attached to that and also some, uh, some big events from uh, 2013? Yeah, well, obviously, we, we, um, we're a music streaming service. We have a free and paid um, subscription model. Um, and uh, we turned five um, two weeks ago, uh, which is a big achievement for us. Happy um, birthday. Thank you. Um, it's the brainchild, really, of Danik and Martin Lawrenson, because obviously, whether you know or not, um, piracy was probably the worst in Sweden than it was anywhere else in the world. And they really felt that, you know, if you could build an alternative, credible um, um, product, people will use it. Um, and obviously, Sweden, the model has proven that. Um, 
we've now, uh, globally, we've got over 24 million active monthly users, um, 6 million registered paying 10, 10 pounds a month or 10 euros, $10 a month. Um, and we're in 32 countries, so um, you know, we're really, really growing fast. And, and globally, we've got 1,000 people working for Spotify. So we've kind of really come on leaps and bounds, particularly over the last couple of years. I think the launch in the US was really, really big for us. Um, some of the big things this year, I think, is um, uh, going more web-based. So previously, you had the desktop application. Um, we, we launched the web player, so now you can access a slightly limited version, um, a restricted version of your account, only ever so slightly, online um, with the URL. And that's kind of changed the way that people can access um, their music a lot easier. Uh, we also uh, launched Disco uh, Discover feature, uh, which basically, because before we were finding that people were kind of had a bit of a paralysis when they were going to Spotify, they had a search bar and 25 million songs. I mean, anyone who's into music even, they would be like, well, I don't know what to, um, to listen to today. So we've turned it on its head. Now it's all about music discovery and recommendations. So based on a listening history and everything, it's going to just basically bring content to you, not just kind of like, you like this artist, you like that, but albums, tracks. Um, we've also uh, launched in a, in a ton of countries this year. So um, all the Baltic states, we've also launched in Mexico, which was big for us, Argentina recently, um, Taiwan, Turkey and Greece. So we're really kind of spreading out beyond the traditional markets. Um, um, and to them, I think you really need to build a campaign around it and have a huge lead up and actually have a hub where people can go find out about it and talk about it and create a really, really multi-platform um, um, campaign. And we built a hub that lived within Spotify where people can access, enter the competition, see previous content, win stuff. And we did um, three, just about to our fourth live streamed event um, in different cities in Germany. And we've had as, uh, as, as many as 200,000 people streaming just to watch one gig. I mean, that's pretty big if we look at some of the other projects we've done. But the campaign around it was a really, really good, big, robust campaign. And I think that really, really made the difference. Um, and, you know, we're looking to continue doing those. So. Right, I've just got a really worrying signal from the back uh, that we are running out of time and I haven't even got to Barbara and Klaus. So really quickly, I'm sorry, Jack, I'm going to cut yeah. you off. No, uh, <laughs> uh, Klaus, uh, Sony Broadcast Equipment, uh, I know that you guys had a major, major year, uh, uh, mainly, bec well, from the live streaming perspectives, because I know that uh, back in May, at NAB in Las Vegas, you guys had the first prototype of uh, something what looks like uh, out of minority report. It's called the Anycast Touch. Uh, and, and this is a long running project for you guys. We, we talked about it earlier. Anycast as a vision mixer uh, uh, encoder unit, uh, A to Z, one, one, one stop shop. It's been around for six, seven years. And now, this amazing touch screen sort of unit getting released this year or early next year. Uh, is this means that live streaming is something what, what Sony thinks is gonna be here for, for good as well and that's why you guys invested uh, money into this territory? Uh, definitely, um, live streaming is, is really important for us. Um, of course, we are covering um, everything from small cameras to, to big cameras, but uh, depending of, of what you're doing, then uh, you need the right tool for your job. And uh, the Anycast Touch is for us a tool that it combines switch uh, for video, audio, streaming, everything built in a compact device um, that is making it easy for you to, to go to a venue and operate this equipment without a lot of uh, know-how of uh, uh, having years of experience, basically. Uh, the, the, the other massive, uh well, it's not even an invention. I don't even know what to call it. It's, it's be up to 4K now with your cameras. You guys on, you know, up in the blue sky, and God knows where you guys are going to go in the next years. I, I heard that there was a, a small band and a small gig what you guys filmed with 4K cameras. Can you tell, tell us about that? Yeah, it was a small gig uh, from News in Rome um, a couple of weeks ago we, that we filmed with uh, 15 F55 cameras in 4K. Um, for us, 4K is a big topic now, and... Uh, um, of course, being the best quality that you can capture at the moment, uh, to bring this to Blu-ray, but also to have content that you can then bring into cinemas. There are nearly, uh, nearly 2,000 4K Sony-equipped uh, uh, cinemas across Europe. And if you have the, the content in 4K, you can, of course, draw people to the cinemas as well as um, sell this in very good quality uh, on Blu-ray. Uh, I'm going to be incredibly rude and 
I'll, well, I'm already rude because I left Barbara for last. She should have been first, ladies first. What was I thinking? Uh, but uh, obviously, we, 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 we're going to hang around here after the, the, the panel. So if you want to come up to us and have any questions, please feel free. Uh, uh, and just quickly s switching to Barbara, uh, my fav favorite content creator. Uh, T tell us a little bit about your influences, because you come from a quite mixed media background, obviously, club promotion, DJing, music, photography, filming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I kind of started with the music and then switched to the image. So uh, that was also very helpful when I switched completely to shooting DJ parties, like techno parties, because I knew exactly the background of it, like how is it to be a DJ and what's, what do you want to be shown, what do you want to hide and stuff like that. I, gu I guess it, it helps to understand music to, in order to film it or taking pictures of it, especially uh, we had long conversations about editing. Yeah. Uh, edi ed editing something is, is different when you give it to an editor who doesn't understand about the club scene and club music, or you give it to someone who's, who grew up in clubs. Uh, yeah. We also mentioned that you uniquely using, funny enough, you're not plugging a, a Sony product for editing for a yeah, certain I purpose. Am. I am because it gives like the, the best possibility to um, edit the sound. We do lots of sound designing with the edits and our, my edits are pretty like dynamic cuts to the quite um, fast tempo. So I think Sony is the best. So it's, it, su it supports it. It's quite, quite interesting because everyone's on Avid or Final Cuts and uh, yeah. you don't hear much of uh, the, the Sony Vegas product. Uh, when did you make the switch to, to actual video and how did Richie Houghton and, and, and all those projects came about? Yeah, I started to tour with Richie like three years ago because he, um, he's always documenting everything what he's doing and we kind of clicked very well together and w was touring with him like three years non-stop. And how, how does the, co has, the, has the ideas, whoops, sorry, who has the ideas for the content? Are you coming up with ideas and tell Richie that, listen, we're doing this? <laughs> uh, it's very much teamwork, of course. Like with the with the entry pool videos that you like so much, it was it was my idea because there was an amazing pool yeah. at the villa. We needed some interviews, so I was like, okay, let's just jump in the pool, like see DJs in a little bit different 